Um, the avoidance obviously is specific related to what the things are that you're allergic to and food labelling in New Zealand is pretty easy in the sense that the common food allergens are all on labels and should be on labels in plain English so you can't say hydrolyzed vegetable protein meaning peanut or caseinate meaning milk it's got to be in English um, all of those precautionary labels the caution may contain traces of made in a factory that also processes those are entirely volitional and they have no regulation about them at all so you don't even have to put the precautionary label on. If you find a biscuit that doesn't have a precautionary label, it doesn't mean it couldn't contain a trace. It means that no one's deliberately put that ingredient in. So it's always worth explaining that to people so that they can make an informed choice about what they're going to do with those products. Um, I think one of the one of the things that we try and focus on is sort of age appropriate education also for the child, because one of the um, one of the situations that we really want to avoid is that parents do all the work about avoidance, but the child never, never actually learns what the thing is that they're allergic to, what it looks like, and how to be, be careful about staying away from it. Um, making sure there's some understanding about confusion and contamination, and trying to, with time, empower the kids about making their own decisions about what they should and shouldn't be eating. Um, In terms of cow's milk, there's obviously some specific questions about what you do as cow's milk alternatives. And so this was um, an Australian consensus published about 10 years ago. And I think this was largely the paper that then the Pharmac um, rules were changed on in terms of what the steps were for, for dairy alternatives. And what it says is that if you've got anaphylaxis, then it's reasonable go to go straight to an amino acid formula. If you've got a less severe IgE-mediated food allergic reaction, then really the question is about using an extensively hydrolyzed formula or soy, and then stepping up from soy to extensively hydrolyzed to amino acid if you need to, or from extensively hydrolyzed to amino acid. Um, and food protein enteropathy syndrome I'll come back to, but that's um, going to extensively hydrolyzed. And so, the only extensively hydrolyzed that we have on the market at the moment is Pepti Junior, or it's now Aptimal Pepti Junior, isn't it? It's, and it is, so that instead of big chunks, the protein's broken down, it's not as extensively hydrolyzed as some of the other formulas that are available overseas. And our experience is probably up to maybe 50% of cow's milk allergic kids will still react to Pepti. And so um, we kind of have to warn patients about that. I certainly wouldn't tell someone to drink a whole bottle in the middle of the night. You know, start with a small amount during the day because you can still get allergic reactions to Pepti. Um, amino acid formula options being a near and allocare, and I think, I don't know, I tend to alternate, and there is sometimes taste preference between them. Cows with allergic patients, it would be unlikely to present an exclusively breast milk. It's rare for it. Is that right? If they're breastfed, then it's, and the mum's having dairy. Uh, so, what, it does a small amount of, if the mum yeah. has like tea, you know, a bit of milk in her tea and coffee, and she has like a bit of yogurt or cereal, yeah. and if the baby's being ex exclusively breastfed, can that baby still present with? With the small amounts via breast milk. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I don't know that I've ever seen it. I guess it is possible. Yeah. But it's not common, especially especially with the smaller amounts. Yeah. <coughs> Does cow's milk allergy typically when they get switched to formula? Yeah. It's immediate yeah. Immediate. That's right. And so seventy five percent of it will be first known exposure to cow's milk. Yeah. And oh, sorry. Okay. No, no. What time frame do you suggest retesting um, children? Um, is it yeah, so it depends really on the food yeah. because um, the natural history of different foods is quite different. And peanuts, nuts, fish, shellfish, the chance of resolution with time is in the order of 10 to 20%. And if it's going to resolve, it takes a long time. So I wouldn't normally test those again for maybe a couple of years. Things like milk or revisiting wheat or egg a little bit sooner. And it depends on other things as well in terms of, you know, if you've had somebody who's 
had an obvious allergic reaction to a quarter of a muffin at challenge with egg, then that's going to take a lot longer to go away than someone who's had three teaspoons of egg and got a little bit of urticaria. So severity in the food, yeah. I don't think there's any rule about it. Mm. Um, soy. When I when I trained, the textbooks all said that soy was cross-reactive with cow's milk, which is clearly stupid because um, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> <laughs> So there was a very nice systematic review of soy published in 2014 in the British Journal of Nutrition. Um, and basically the summary's up there. In conclusion, modern soy infant formulas are evidence-based safety options to feed children. Growth, bone health, metabolic, reproductive, endocrine, immune and neurologic function is similar to those fed on cow's milk or human milk. So I think that's really useful. You know, if you Google soy, you can come away thinking it's the most dangerous thing ever. And being able to point people to this, I think it's open access, whole text is actually really useful in terms of saying, actually, it's fine. Yeah. So what is the cross-reactivity rate between dairy and soy? Well, I don't think it's cross-reactivity. Well, like I said, we would only see, I reckon, three or four soy allergic kids a year. So probably lower than um, the Pepti Junior then. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So why go to Pepti Junior? Why not just go to soy? Well, I do often just go to soy, but especially because they're often older. I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried Pepti Junior, but it's really. I haven't, but everyone who has tells me it's really revolting. Um, so it's an acquired taste. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. So I think in the older kids, there's no point in battling trying to get them to drink something that tastes horrible. And soy is a reasonable option. So was the concern with soy the phytoestrogens? Yeah, I, that yes, that and um, a question about uh, reprodu- long-term reproductive outcomes of that, which there aren't any differences of. Yeah. But that's just for formula, not talking about soy milk. Yeah. Well, it's about soy, full stop. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, but I don't think it's a real concern. Well, it's a real concern, but I don't think it needs to be based on what we know. Um, baking. So this is probably one of the biggest changes in terms of management of these kids in the last 10 years, and it's to do with baking and resolution. So um, this is time point zero starting to eat egg in baking and your chances of resolution of egg allergy. So the red line is the kids who could eat baking and did and the black line is the kids either who couldn't because they were allergic to egg even in that form or didn't. And so we know that um, a lot of the proteins you're allergic to are, what are a conformational proteins so they're folded up structures and a lot of those folded structures are heat sensitive so in cooking that particular protein will be broken down Mm -hmm. and if you can tolerate egg in baking then it seems that that promotes tolerance and resolution of the egg allergy this is retrospective looking back at a population over time and obviously people are doing this prospectively now but that's not published and the graph with milk looks very similar but someone was asking me about um patterns of resolution compared to historically. So this is 48 months, that's four years. The kids who can't tolerate egg and baking have got about a 15% resolution, and the kids who could have got just over 60%. So it makes a difference, but it's not really fast. Um, So it's about 75% of milk and or egg can tolerate it in baking. There's a couple of, these are British guidelines about home introduction of baking um, with milk and egg. And I think home introduction is a reasonable option for the kids who've had larger volumes and more mild food allergic reactions. So that, you know, if you've had half a bottle of milk and got urticaria, then it's probably okay to do milk arrow root biscuits at home. I would be a bit more cautious about the kids who've had significant reactions on smaller exposure or if they've definitely had anaphylaxis. And this was some Sydney stuff, just um, looking at doing baked egg challenges um, in kids who presented with a variety of reactions to eggs. So some with anaphylaxis, but 
quite a lot without anaphylaxis and some just with a positive test. And with their baked egg challenges, they still had about 14% with anaphylaxis, um, two of whom they needed uh, adrenaline, and to relatively small amounts, so a tenth of a muffin, meaning that we do need to be a little bit cautious about telling people just to give it a go at home, depending on what the story is. Just the risk, this, is it a cumulative risk as well? Like, so, you know, this these children obviously had a reaction after a tenth of a muffin, but for the children that perhaps didn't, they had some mild to moderate symptoms, and the next time they're more likely? No, so that idea that the next reaction will be worse is probably wrong. The next reaction might be worse, but actually it's probably got a good chance it's not going to be. Yeah. I think what reaction you have on any given day depends on dose and whatever else you're doing and whether you're well or not. And and whether you had a glass of wine, obviously. <laughs> yeah. um, I think anybody, or any of these kids who've got IgE-mediated food allergies should have an action plan, because I think we're not very good at predicting who's going to get into trouble, even though most of them aren't going to get into trouble no matter what happens. Um, on the ASCIA website, there is where the action plans are, but there's also some quite good sort of FAQ sheets, and there's a video about how to use an EpiPen, and there's instructions in other languages uh, as well. There's links through to e-learning, anaphylaxis, food allergy, um, and, and other things as well in terms of rhinitis and immune deficiency, which anybody can register and do. And the anaphylaxis stuff is actually really, I think, really useful for practice nurses, anyone who's giving vaccinations or immunotherapy. As you all know, EpiPens are not funded. Um, epiclub.co.nz uh, will send families out a trainer device, and they also have a uh, they have a button sort of to buy, and they don't actually sell them, but what they do is they have a list of pharmacies with um, their prices, which is really useful, because the most I've ever heard someone paying was $210, and, and on this that gets down to 120 so I think it's... Uh, yeah, so mostly 12 to 14 months, yeah. Um, that's just you know what the action plans look like. The biggest change on the EpiPen plan is going to be that um, when the next stock comes into the New Zealand, the, the push down and hold um, will change from 10 seconds to 3 seconds because the labelling's changed in the states and so the next batch of pens will change and then all the action plans will change. The only other thing I'd say about action plans is we so I wouldn't tend to use a sedating antihistamine on an allergic reaction action plan because if they then go to sleep, then it's really quite hard to tell what's going on. Yeah. Can I just ask a question about yeah. eating kittens and the fact that they're obviously really useful tools? Is mm. there any push to getting them <coughs> I think they were given medium priority by PTAC a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, the trouble from Pharmac's point of view is they are really expensive for a really cheap drug and it's very hard to prove that they're useful in the sense that, um, you know, if you ask people, have you got your EpiPen with you, then sometimes they don't. And so, you know, there's, you can't show that they save lives because you're not going to randomise. Yeah. Mm. So, there's, I mean, there's, it's been an ongoing discussion for a long time. Well, if you do use it, you can get one. Yeah, if you do, that's right. If you've got one and you've used it, th then ACC will cover the replacement cost. Okay. Mm. Not always without dispute, but they will eventually. <laughs> and Allergy New Zealand can be very useful, actually, in that regard. Does that require you visiting a doctor again? Well, if you've used it, you should be seeing a doctor anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think risk assessment of uh, food allergy is actually quite difficult because um, it's hard to predict. We've got all these kids and young people with food allergy and trying to work out who's going to get into trouble is really difficult. You know, there are some commonalities. So if you look at um, who has ever got into trouble, age, there are vanishingly few preschoolers in any of the case series of fatal or near-fatal food allergic reactions, whereas we see a lot of food allergy in preschoolers. Um, but it's mostly older kids, adolescents, young adults. Um, 
almost everybody who dies of food allergy also has asthma. And there's some stuff out of the UK registry that said that of the patients where they knew the history, 50% of them had had active asthma in the week preceding their death. Mm -hmm. Suggesting that maybe if you're twitchy at the time and then you have a food reaction on top of that, you get into more trouble because it is mostly respiratory deaths. Peanut and nut are always responsible for a significant proportion and in some ways that, that's actually difficult because for families who've got anaphylaxis to cow's milk, actually there's not as much understanding or recognition about, you know, it can be just as severe. I think one of the um, things I almost, that I, this is what I wanted to add in, you see, it was important. Um, when you look at the registries, half of the patients who die haven't had a previous severe food allergic reaction, and that was, so it's a UK series and an American series, there's about 70 odd patients in each series. So half of them, they were people who knew they were food allergic reaction, they'd had previous allergic reactions, and they hadn't had an allergic reaction bad enough to take them to an emergency department but on this occasion they had a fatal food allergic reaction. And that's quite worrying because it just makes it very hard to predict who's going to get into trouble. Um, and then the other things that we think about, you know, if you live in Mount Eden and you've had not that bad food allergic reactions, uh, then it's much easier to access care than if you live on the barrier. Ability to comply with avoidance, you know, mo a lot of kids are very good and some kids are not. <laughs> um, and then comorbidity. So if you've got asthma and nut allergy, even if you haven't had anaphylaxis, then most of the time we're going to err on the side of saying, well, you know, it's, you pay for your house insurance not anticipating needing it, but if you need it, you need it. Um, trying to, you know, it's that thing about you want to balance, you want caution and care, but not paranoia and we don't want this to take over people's lives we just want them to be careful this is um, an estimated risk of uh, fatal food anaphylaxis for food allergic people aged 0 to 19 in the UK um, which is you know higher than the risk from well it's lower risk from any death in Europe um, that's death by murder in Europe this is death by murder in America, so, you know. So that, but I think people, you know, so we've got to try and keep it in perspective. It's not that the risk is zero, and we, we want to stop it from happening, but equally we want to, you know, make sure people can live normal lives. Oh, so that's up here. That's the calculation of the, you know, so it's, it's, it's low. Um, in terms of supervised food challenges, uh, most of the paediatric units around the country will do some of these and mostly they're either um, to clarify where things don't really make sense or to see if someone's grown out of something if they've had a previous significant reaction or sometimes if you've got a positive test and you really don't have any idea whether they're allergic or not. And Mostly, I think everyone's using the same protocols, which are all ASCIA based, and which means that with time our results can all be compared. And in fact, and one of my colleagues is just pulling together all of the New Zealand Challenge stuff for the ASCIA conference later in the year. Future directions, well, one of the things that we probably get better at is understanding exactly which bit of foods are the most important. And so peanuts are complicated protein, and there's subunits within that. ERA H2 is one of those, it's a, it's a storage protein so, which tends to mean it's pretty stable and measuring specific IgE directed against the ERA H2 is probably more informative than just measuring specific IgE against peanut um, with some quite, you know, likelihood ratios of up to about of over about 10 probably means that it's very useful in clinical practice and stuff in the UK to say that um, sensitised in the UK gave you a likelihood ratio of about 25 that you're truly peanut allergic. So it's really just another way of trying to be sure about whether you've got persistent allergy without having to challenge all of these patients. And then the other thing that patients are really interested in is food desensitisation. And 
there's an enormous variety of protocols that are being proposed for this and different modifications to protocols. So there's a Melbourne one doing desensitisation with probiotics and there's another one starting with short chain fatty acids and there's a patch in the United States that's now in phase three trials, so peanut, which kind of doesn't really make sense to me why a peanut patch promotes, desens promotes tolerance, but it does seem to. Um, and all of the studies do pretty much the same thing. They get you up to a point where you can have a bit of peanut on a regular basis without trouble. And if you can have a little bit regularly, it seems to give you some protection against a larger amount. The trouble is that almost all of the studies also, if you're having a little bit regularly, you're okay most of the time, but actually sometimes you're not okay out of the blue. And also if you stop, you don't necessarily maintain that tolerance, that some people will be tolerant and some people will go back to square one. And so that regular ingestion uh, may be critical for some people if we can work out who it's important for. And, you know, trying to get a 15 year old to do anything every day in my house is almost impossible so I you know I think it's still very much a watch this space it's likely that it'll be a treatment option at some stage but the editorial comment is still largely this is a research tool and we're not quite ready to roll it out into routine clinical practice but hopefully um, so I think that was my key points common problem the history's trumps skin test or specific IgE to confirm specialist referral to paediatrics, particularly anaphylaxis, complicated food allergy, or where you need help with uh, interpretation of tests or ongoing management, that everyone should have an action plan and that they need follow up because we really want to know if you are the lucky ones that grow out of these, then we want to know that that's the case. And then I just put some cases together briefly. Um, really to illustrate some of the some of the sort of pitfalls. So this was a boy who I'd seen his brother for multiple food allergies and the family were reasonably anxious. Um, and you know, pros and cons, and you can argue whether it's a good thing or not, but at five months we skin tested him for milky peanuts and said, that's great, you can go home and try them. But of course they waited until 11 months and he had anaphylaxis to peanut. Mm. You know, I mean, I still see him, they do come back, so. <laughs> But it's, you know, and I obviously didn't give them the message that this is now that we want to do this. They thought, that's great, we'll do it when we get round to it. So it's only true at the time. I, I, had, a, I had a patient who um, similarly had negative symptoms and they introduced peanut, but they only introduced it once. <laughs> and then didn't for another six months and then had their yeah. anaphylaxis. Yeah. <laughs> So introducing means starting it and eating it regularly. Um, this is really just, you know, all that looks like anaphylaxis is not necessarily anaphylaxis. This was a big boy known to be milk, egg and peanut allergic, got suddenly short of breath and thought his lips were swollen at a family function and used his own EpiPen. All sounds perfectly reasonable. And over the next three months he used his own EpiPen eight times and he was having panic attacks. And so, you know, it's really just thinking carefully about the story. Because it, it, the first time I thought it was fine, the second time I thought it was dodgy. Yeah. By the eighth time, it was pretty I obvious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but by, I think as it went on, the trouble is it all got so, there was so much secondary gain to being so highly allergic mm -hmm. that it was really quite complicated to stop it. Do you have access at Starship in the food allergy team for a psychologist? Yeah. There's quite a few teenagers like this. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we do. And use them frequently and often, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just going through the um, anaphylaxis management, in kids under one, who present to you with just urticaria after eating someone. Is it safe or do you need to give them an anti-histamine? Because I put strictly, like if you look at our formula, it says that we shouldn't be given even, um, I know the paediatrician says on over one they use cetirizine, but we, the, our like thing says not for children under one. I think cetirizine's fine. I think it's really well studied and I'm quite happy to use it. Whether you have to use it or not, you know, the point of it is it makes you feel better if you're itchy. Yeah. And if you're itchy and bothered by urticaria, then I'll treat it. Mm. 
if you're not and you've got half a dozen hives, then you don't have to treat it. And, and giving antihistamines is not going to stop it getting worse if it's going to. So it's not about trying to prevent anaphylaxis, it's just about making you feel better. Right, so it's not going to prevent. And, no. and a small dose and other ones isn't going to cause respiratory No, no, that's right. In fact, I think ETAC went down to, it was all just one of the cetirizine studies, I thought it went down to six months, but I can double check. And I think Telfast is actually registered down to six months, isn't it? So I have to look it up. Anyway. Um, 14-year-old boy, peanut allergic reaction with urticaria at age one. I had seen him at five and he had a peanut-specific IgE of over 100, so I was pretty sure he hadn't grown out of it. And he'd had some positive nuts on testing and was avoiding. And, um, and then kind of stopped coming back to follow up, which was fair enough because he knew he was allergic. He ate one kale chip, um, that was the packet, and it felt unwell, and, and quite unwell. And they went off to the dog, and by the time he got there, he was red, wheezy, hypotensive, and desaturated. Does anyone want to hazard a guess? Um, no, they do not live in Greyland. <laughs> That's very cheeky. Um, so, uh, the answer was that it's got cashew in it, actually. There are two brands of kale chips on the market that have got cashew in them. What the hell for? I've got no idea. This is just to remind me to say that... So this is skin prick testing data from you know small skin tests to massive severity of allergic reaction from mild to severe anaphylaxis. So you've got these guys over here with four millimetre skin tests and really bad anaphylaxis. And this one over here with a 22 millimetre skin test, which is really big, and a mild allergic reaction. And this is the RAST data from the same study. So mild allergic reactions, one third of them have got a high blood test. Severe food allergic reactions, one third of them have got a high test. Your testing's not about severity. Um, this is, I, I don't, I'm not very good at pulling jokes in, but um, I was telling a cashew allergic family about the kale chip story, and the father said to me, he said he was South African and he, kale. Um, why should you always use coconut oil when you make kale chips? No? That's the I quite like that. Um, three-year-old model, but this is another patient I'd seen, and actually it wasn't, his mother had always said he was fussy, and when he came back at the age of three, I realised that I'd written down the same four foods that he would eat that I'd written down the year before and the year before. Um, and her comment was that he was, he would gag and vomit if she got anything wrong, and vomit sometimes randomly for no particular reason. And he had multiple food allergies already, and um, kind of the penny eventually dropped and what he had is eosinophilic esophagitis on biopsy. Yeah, yeah. And so this is one of those conditions that was invented after I went to medical school, which <laughs> is not good. Um, but this is just a comparison of signs and symptoms. So in little kids, failure to thrive, feeding difficulty, food refusal, vomiting, gastroesophageal reflux, type symptoms, abdominal pain. But that feeding... Ref Difficulty food refusal is often texture, and they get really stuck on soft puree type stuff because not only do you get eosinophilic infiltration in the esophagus, but the esophagus, the esophageal motility is not very good, and so stuff doesn't go down very easily. Adults tend to present much more, well, actually, probably often with food impaction, so they've got so much inflammation that stuff gets stuck on the way down. And the rate of eosinophilic esophagitis has increased in parallel, but probably starting later than the rest of the food allergy epidemic. And we see it increasingly. And the risk factors in kids anyway, more boys than girls, mostly food allergic, and mostly some combination of fussy, mm. but they're fussy for too long. And because they don't deal with real big allies, do they? No, so they don't. Oh, they're not, not moment. Yeah, so they're not PPI responsive. Um, you've really got two options in terms of treatment. You can either treat it medically, where you use like an asthma inhaler, but swallow it, yeah. so swallowed fluticasone, or else you can treat it with diet. And there's milk is probably the biggest, well, milk and wheat are probably the biggest contributors, and it's not necessarily IgE-mediated yeah. allergy, yeah. It's, but taking milk and wheat out of the diet yeah. is often the thing that, well, will fix it, or else you can do a food four food elimination or six food elimination or 
elemental formula. Mm. Um, six month old, sudden onset profuse vomiting who needed uh, intravenous fluid resuscitation. He'd been on cow's milk formula from two months and had just tried some Farrex for the first time two hours before onset of symptoms. And we would see, I don't know, maybe half a dozen of these a year. And so this is another, oh, there you are, you see, that's when I tried to make it look better. Um, really, really typical for food protein enteropathy syndrome, so f pies, which is a very food-specific, non-IgE-mediated reaction, and we don't really know what the immunology is for this condition. This is some Sydney children's stuff just showing increased rates of diagnosis between sort of 1990s through to late 2000s and probably higher again now. And, and it's a different group of foods. Milk and soy do do it a bit, but rice is by far and away the commonest solid food that we see it to. And it's this really classical story because it's almost two, it's often two hours to the dot and they start vomiting and they vomit and vomit and vomit and vomit and it just, you know, they might carry on vomiting for a couple of hours and by the time they come to ED they just look awful and often get thought of as being septic and worked up and sometimes it's not until the second time that somebody realises that it was rice the first time as well so it's a really, it's quite, quite a tricky one but the vomiting's almost universal um, and they're often a bit cold rather than hot. 